Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to talk about fascism, a term that is very often misused and a term that's very often misunderstood. If a person wants to understand a religion or an ideology or a political movement or even wants to understand another person, uh, the first and foremost uh, thing to do, of course, is to go to the source and understand what people actually say who call themselves that. But in the case of fascism, the term is thrown around a lot, mostly by people who use it not as a description, but as a smear term. And the term is thrown around very loosely in that way. Well, today I'm going to try to talk about what fascism really was and what it wasn't. To be more precise, the ideology of fascism and the political movement that became known as the fascist movement grew up in Italy in the years right after the end of the First World War, the terrible conflict that resulted in the deaths of millions of Europeans that was very destructive and which shattered the stable and seemingly solid European dominant, dominant world order that had been in place until that time. Many Americans might not realize it, but the term fascist or fascism uh, has a very simple origin. It comes from a fascio. It comes from the Latin word for a league. And a fascis, originally in the ancient uh, Rome, was a bundle of rods bound together to symbolize both unity in uh, strength and unity and to symbolize authority. It was a symbol of the Roman Senate. Many Americans might not uh, realize it or even want to realize it, but the symbol of the United States Senate is also the fascist. If you visit the United States Senate chamber in Washington, D.C., and you might notice that on both sides of the speaker's platform are two bundles of rods. Those are fascists. Uh, up until 1946, on the back of the American dime was a fascist, a symbol also of unity and authority, which comes from ancient Rome. But fascism as a political movement and an ideology emerged from the chaos of the First World War, when all of the old assumptions about how society should be organized, the right and wrong in social life and so forth, were called into question. In the aftermath of the First World War, which brought down the uh, Romanov dynasty in Russia and the end of the Russian Empire, and saw the triumph in Russia of the Bolshevik Marxist movement, it also brought down the Hohenzollern dynasty in Germany, the Habsburg dynasty in Austria-Hungary, and the breaking up of that great empire. But it also was a shattering experience for all of Europe, including in Italy. In fact, the First World War was so destructive, not merely in loss of life and in uh, destruction of property, but in a shattering of values that the famous American historian and diplomat George F. Kennan called the First World War the seminal catastrophe of the 20th century, the seminal basic catastrophe that led to, almost inevitably, the chaos and horrors of the Second World War and much of the other great problems of the 20th century. Italy was, during the First World War, on the Allied side, that is, allied with Britain and France and for a time with Russia and the United States during World War I. But Italy, even though Italy had suffered greatly in the First World War, when the war ended, many Italians felt that the sacrifice had been largely in vain. There was very little to show for the tremendous loss of life that Italians had suffered during that uh, during the First World War. And there was enormous confusion about the kind of leadership and the kind of social political organization that Italy should have. Out of this, there emerged a 
uh, organization of former veterans of the First World War called the Fossi di Combattimento, the League of Veterans of the First World War, led by a young veteran named Benito Mussolini. Now, he was a, an extraordinarily uh, gifted and capable man who had been very active in the socialist movement in Italy. In fact, he had been so prominent as a socialist that uh, he was for a time the editor of the main socialist daily newspaper in Italy, Avanti, Forward, published in Milan. He had been a soldier in the First World War, and he had been wounded in that conflict, but he was also well-educated, multilingual, uh, very good writer, and he emerged as a leader of this uh, League of Veterans, which um, at first had no really clear-cut ideology. It was nationalistic, it was uh, aggressive, but it had also ideas of social justice that were taken from the popular uh, socialist and leftist movements of the time. In Italy, in Germany, in Austria, in Hungary, in much of Eastern Europe, Poland and so forth, there was tremendous chaos and confusion. But there was a common questions that people all across Europe asked themselves over and over in the aftermath of the First World War. And one of those questions that people ask was this. If it was possible for a nation and a society to mobilize and organize tremendous resources for war, for destructive purposes, could it not be possible, shouldn't it be possible, for nations to organize and mobilize resources for constructive, positive purposes, instead of building uh, tanks and machine guns and bullets and uniforms and helmets and artillery and battleships, people ask themselves, could it not be possible to mobilize and organize these same resources to build homes, to build schools and roads, and to build uh, dams and things that would produce a better and a more happier and prosperous society? These are questions that people ask over and over in Europe and also in Italy, because in the aftermath of the First World War, uh, Italy was governed by a squabbling, inefficient, uh, unfocused coalition of various political parties that were interested more in holding on to power than in trying to build Italian society with any really comprehensive idea or vision of the future. And the fascist movement that emerged in Italy in the aftermath of the First World War reflected this kind of confusion because itself didn't have a really clear-cut goal or ideology except, to, except a, a strong will to replace the disorder and the chaos with some sort of unity and direction in Italian society. Well, the National Fascist Party, which grew out of this, headed by Mussolini, who was a very skilled polemicist and writer, soon attracted enormous popular support. It wasn't merely that the uh, membership and the following of the Fascist Party in Italy in the years 1919, 1920, 1921 was larger than that of any of the other parties, but that its uh, membership and its following was far more active, far more aggressive, far more focused, far more disciplined than that of the other political parties. And this led in 1922 to the so-called March on Rome, when uh, followers of Benito Mussolini and his fascist party arrived in Rome to seize power. Well, so impressive was this show of force that the king of Italy um, uh, granted uh, Mussolini the premiership of the country, made him head of the government, although the king still remained the head of state, because Italy was, after all, a kingdom. But Italy, uh, Mussolini became the head of the government and began in 1922 step by step 
to consolidate his power and authority and the authority of the fascist movement in Italy. The popular image of Benito Mussolini and the Italian fascist regime in America today is, to an enormous extent, a product of propaganda from World War II, because, after all, during the war, Mussolini and Italy were allies of Germany and of Japan, and therefore enemies during the war of the United States and its allies. And naturally, during World War II, there was tremendous propaganda to portray uh, Italy and Mussolini as clownish, thuggish, evil, bad, and so forth. That was the wartime image of Mussolini, the so-called duce, or leader of the fascist movement. He was portrayed as a bully, as clownish, as a poser, theatrical, and so forth. But that was not always his image in America. During the 1920s, uh, in the years after his party came to power in 1922, and in the early 1930s, up until about 1935 or 36, Mussolini and the fascist regime in Italy were generally very well regarded in the United States. A professor of history in California, a man named John Diggins, wrote a study entitled Mussolini and Fascism that was published in 1972. And he notes, and I'm quoting, whatever Mussolini's reputation is today, from the time of the fascist march on Rome in 1922 to the beginning of the Ethiopian War, that is in 1935, Mussolini was an esteemed figure. Americans in particular saw in Mussolini certain enduring qualities which enabled him to qualify as a great man, not only of his time, but of the ages. In 1923, the New York Times, the most influential daily newspaper in the United States, wrote of Mussolini's conception of power and authority in these words. It says that his, the fascist view of power and authority, quote, has many points in common with that of the men who inspired our own Constitution, John Adams, Hamilton, and Washington. During those days, one of the most widely read magazines in the United States and one of the most influential was the Saturday Evening Post, a weekly with almost 3 million subscribers in 1930. This magazine published numerous articles praising Mussolini and his regime, and that reflected the general view in the United States during those years. The U.S. ambassador to Italy was a man named Richard Washburn Child. He was so impressed with Mussolini that he initiated and played a major role in producing Mussolini's autobiography in English, which was published in 1928 by Charles Scribner's son, one of the leading New York publishing firms. And the autobiography of Mussolini appeared that same year in serialized form in the widely read Saturday Evening Post. In his foreword to the book, the American ambassador praised Mussolini as, quote, both wise and humane, as an administrator of what he called super statesmanship, and as a political leader of what he called permanent greatness. In fascist Italy, wrote the U.S. envoy, quote, unexpected joy is found in the leadership of a Mussolini. It is absurd to say that Italy groans under discipline. Italy chortles with it. It is victory. Mussolini, the U.S. ambassador, went on to explain, quote, has not only been able to secure and hold an almost universal following, he has built a new state upon a new concept of a state. He has not only been able to change the lives of human beings, but he has changed their minds, their hearts, their spirits. He has not merely ruled a house, he has built a new house. The U.S. President at the time, Franklin Roosevelt, expressed admiration for the Italian leader and sent him cordial letters. In June of 1933, President Roosevelt praised Mussolini in a letter to a, an American envoy. He wrote, 
I am much interested and deeply impressed by what he, that is Mussolini, has accomplished, and by his evidenced honest purpose of restoring Italy and seeking to prevent general European trouble. In another letter, a few weeks later, President Roosevelt wrote, quote, I don't mind telling you in confidence that I, that I am, keep, am keeping in fairly close touch with the admirable Italian gentleman. Mussolini's regime received particularly warm praise from American business leaders. Professor Diggins, who I mentioned earlier, wrote in his 1972 book, and I'm quoting, with few exceptions, the dominant voices of business responded to fascism with a hearty enthusiasm. Favorable editorials could be read in publications such as Barron's, Journal of Commerce and Commercial Bulletin, Commerce and Finance, Nation's Business, which was the official organ of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and the reputable Wall Street Journal. Aside from the press, the list of outspoken business admirers reads like a Wall Street who's who. The readers of the prestigious American business magazine Fortune in the issue of May 1932 were told, quote, in the world depression marked by governmental wandering and uncertainty, Mussolini remains direct. He presents to the virtue of force and centralized government acting without conflict for the whole nation at once. Two months later, Fortune compared fascist Italy's social policies with those of the Democratic Party in the United States. Quote, the corporate state is to Mussolini what the New Deal is to Roosevelt. Well, because Mussolini had been a soldier in the First World War and was the leader of a government that stressed patriotism, it's not surprising that many American veterans admired Mussolini and his nationalist movement. Uh, the head of the American Legion, the na largest veterans group in the U.S., declared in 1923, quoting, I'm quoting, if ever needed, the American Legion stands ready to protect our country's institutions and ideals as the fascisti dealt with the destructionists who menaced Italy. Do not forget that the fascisti are to Italy what the American Legion is to the United States. In the same way, uh, the American Roman Catholic press reported sympathetically on fascist Italy and its leader, and it was encouraged in this regard very much by the signing in February 1929 of the Lateran Treaty between Mussolini and the Vatican. Now, this was very important because it meant an end to a long-standing dispute between the Italian state and the Vatican. Before Italy became a unified country in the 19th century, the Vatican had very large holdings uh, uh, in Italy. But when Italy uh, became consolidated as a nation, the Italian state seized these holdings, and the Pope lived in a kind of uh, twilight zone legally of exactly where his authority was and what the situation was in, in Italy. And there was a kind of a truce between the Vatican and Italy, uh, marked by tremendous distrust between the Vatican, the head of the Roman Catholic uh, Church around the world, and the Italian government. And this was finally resolved by the Lateran Treaty of 1929, which remains in force to this day. The most important feature of which was the setting up of the Vatican city-state and papal sovereignty and authority over this small enclave in the city of Rome. The American attitude toward Mussolini uh, changed quite a lot during Italy's military subjugation of Ethiopia in 1935-36, hearkening, hearkening back to the legacy of the Roman Empire as a model <coughs> or at least an inspiration for the Italy of the 20th century. It's important to remember at this time that many European countries had large colonial holdings. Uh, France had enormous colonial holdings <clears throat> around the world, including in Africa, uh, Indochina, what is now Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and so forth. And, of course, the British Empire was by far the world's largest at the time. But Italy also 
uh, had a colonial empire that at the time included Libya and uh, Albania, which was a kind of a nominally independent country under the same Italian king. <clears throat> but the, uh, under Mussolini, Italy sought to uh, revenge uh, the, and, uh, the defeat of Italy in the late 19th century by taking Ethiopia. Italy already had uh, uh, Italian Somaliland, but it took um, uh, Ethiopia in a military campaign that was widely condemned and criticized in the United States and in much of Europe. Now, even though uh, by uh, world standards at the time many people condemned this, it's worth noting, of course, that uh, it was highly hypocritical for people in Britain or even the United States or France to condemn Italy for acquiring Ethiopia, considering that these countries had their own colonial holdings and weren't about or ready to give them up themselves. Italy, uh, Mussolini was so popular that a popular hit tune of 1934 by the American composer Cole Porter and called You're the Top had a line in it, You're the Top, You're Mussolini. Well, reflecting the changing attitude a year later, uh, this line was deleted from the lyrics of this popular song. Well, we'll take a break at this point and resume with the second half of this broadcast in a few moments. During the time that fascism was in power in Italy from 1922 to 1944-45, there were efforts made to define fascism as an ideology, but they were never complete or final. There are a number of features of fascism as an ideology that are clear, but others that are not so clear. For one thing, fascism does stress the unity of the nation. It stresses the importance of the state and government carrying out policies for the good of everyone, not just for the good of specific special interests. And this is a theme that you'll hear in fact, repeated over and over in all societies, putting the common good ahead of the special interests or the particular interests of this or that group. Now, in the aftermath of the First World War, and especially because of the challenge of Bolshevism, which emphasized class struggle, the struggle of working class against capitalism, uh, fascism, like uh, ideologies in other parts of Europe, National Socialism in Germany and so forth, stressed that, uh, rejected this Marxist notion and stressed instead that the interests of the working class and the interests of uh, managers and owners of business were more unitary than they were conflicting. That is, um, as much as there might be uh, differences and conflicts between employees and employers, that their interests as Italians in the same society uh, took precedence. And as a result, in a fascist society, similarly as in a national socialist state, strikes were not allowed. Workers were not allowed to uh, create chaos and carry out a form of economic warfare for their own interests uh, when that meant a disruption of uh, productive work for the society as a whole. So fascism rejects the Marxist notion of class struggle and the need for a permanent victory of the working class. By the same token, fascism rejects the liberal, democratic view of the emphasis on the individual that is characteristic of American society today and of parliamentary democracy and of capitalist society. Fascism emphasizes the uh, common interests of everybody in the society and the uh, nationalist interests of the society. It rejects, it regards itself as neither left nor right wing. It rejects conservatism because it's a uh, dynamic uh, movement that um, understands or accepts the notion of conflict in society. 
but that uh, the conflict in a healthy society or in a fascist society should be directed and not just merely um, uh, self-defeating and uh, self-conflicting within the same society. The most uh, detailed explanation of fascism as an ideology appeared in a lengthy article published in the <clears throat> Encyclopedia Italiana and written by the philosopher Giovanni Gentile. <clears throat> in this article, um, the, which is the, probably the most authoritative uh, single presentation of the fascist ideology, uh, Gentile wrote, the fascist accepts and loves life. He rejects and despises suicide as cowardly. Life, as he understands it, means duty, elevation, conquest. Life must be lofty and full. It must be lived for oneself, but above all, for others, both nearby and far off, present and future. One of the slogans that uh, Mussolini uh, proclaimed in one of his speeches, he said once that it's better to live a day as a lion than a lifetime as a lamb. Uh, fascism emphasized action. It emphasized um, uh, uh, energy and mobility and so forth. The doctrine of fascism also stressed a great deal the rising of living standards, but of all Italians, not just one group or one class. And there was great efforts made to try to bring greater social equality in society. And, um, and the form that this took was the um, building of what was called a corporativist state, in which there was uh, maximum cooperation between employers and employees within society. Um, with uh, parallels to some of the policies in other countries, there was a tremendous emphasis on uh, social programs that benefited workers, promoted social mobility. One of the features of fascism and of similar phenomena in ideologies in other European countries and other nations is the emphasis on the nation and on the heritage of the nation. And that's one of the reasons why uh, fascism in Italy has different aspects and features than National Socialism in Germany or the regimes that grew up in and arose in countries like Portugal or Spain or other countries. They were all, um, to use a very broad term, authoritarian, but they had very, very different features. For one thing, fascism isn't, doesn't have any particular uh, racial uh, content. In fact, in the first fascist government that took power under Mussolini, one of the cabinet ministers was Jewish, and there were uh, Jewish followers and supporters and activists within the fascist movement in its early years. There's nothing inherently anti-Jewish uh, or about the fascist ideology. The relationship, well, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the uh, ideology that took power in Portugal and Spain, which is called fascists, um, these are called fascist regimes. There are some significant differences between uh, the uh, regime of Francisco Franco in, in Spain or of Salazar in Portugal and, of course, uh, the Mussolini uh, regime of Italy. In practice, the fascist regime did succeed in bringing about much more social order, stability, and even prosperity in Italy during the Mussolini years. That's one of the reasons why it won such ardent support and applause from people all around the world. Uh, in Britain, for example, uh, Winston Churchill, who later would denounce uh, Mussolini during World War II, was during the late 1920s and early 1930s an admirer of Mussolini because um, although the economic uh, growth was not spectacular during the fascist period, it was noticeable and uh, to use the cliche that was used over and over, Mussolini got the railroads working on, rail the, the trains ran on time they would say. Well there was greater 
order and stability in the regime. Businesses prospered, uh, not to the extent that they did in National Socialist Germany, but nonetheless, it was uh, on balance a record that won admiration and applause, not only from Italians who overwhelmingly supported Mussolini and the fascist regime in the pre-war years, but also from people all across uh, Europe and in the United States. One feature of the uh, fascist regime that was particularly admired was the uh, war that Mussolini waged against organized crime. Shortly after taking power, um, he began a campaign, a very systematic campaign, against organized crime, against the mafia, which flourished, of course, above all in southern Italy, in Sicily, in uh, the south of, the, of Italy, and in Sardinia and Corsica. Especially beginning in 1926, the Italian authorities organized the mass arrests and very much publicized trials of leading mafia figures in Italy that led to very large numbers of convictions uh, for murder, crime, and other things, other, other uh, offenses in Italy. Um, for example, there was um, a tremendous trial in February 1928 of 341 mafia suspects. Another huge trial that same year in Palermo of 379 uh, defendants. And this, these uh, massive trials and crackdown on the mafia, above all carried out by a prosecutor named Cesare Mori of Palermo, won tremendous admiration in the media, above all in the United States. The New York Times ran numerous articles uh, covering the uh, fascist war against the mafia with very laudatory articles uh, for readers of the New York Times. In a column and a half story that appeared in January 16, 1928 issue of the New York Times, readers were told, quote, breaking the backbone of the mafia is one of Premier Mussolini's great achievements. The Times also wrote, Prefect Mori of Palermo, the prosecutor, who has broken the back of the mafia in Sicily, will go down in history as a deliverer and superman. The New York Times ran three com commendatory profiles of Cesare Mori. And uh, the uh, New York Times correspondent in Italy seemed almost boundless in his admiration for the man who was most responsible in the fascist government of cracking down on the mafia. Of course, the mafia didn't just uh, sit back and uh, accept all of this. The mafia had its own uh, ruthless means of fighting against the efforts by the Mussolini government to crack down on its criminal activities. But one of the most interesting features of the fascist regime is that in its early years, there was no death penalty. Remarkably, the uh, fascist regime of Mussolini, despite the reputation of it being so ruthless and bloodthirsty, was actually um, rather benign in many ways, certainly compared to that of the United States. As already mentioned, in the first four years of the fascist regime, there was no death penalty at all, in contrast, for example, with the United States today. I mean, to make uh, another comparison, the percentage of people who are incarcerated in American prisons and jails today in the United States is one of the highest in the world and one of the highest, in fact, in history. Far, far higher, both in absolute and in relative terms, than incarcerations in Italy during the Mussolini period. But it wasn't until 1926 that the death penalty was introduced in Italy. And this was following a third assassination attempt against Mussolini in that year. The regime proposed the reestablishment of the death penalty, and the Italian Senate approved this. But it's important to realize that the death penalty in fascist Italy during this period was very severely restricted to a limited number of offenses, treason, espionage, armed rebellion, 
and attempts of life on the head of the state. Uh, in other words, um, the death penalty did not apply to cases of murder uh, in a normal sense, only uh, was restricted to those few uh, cases. And this meant that uh, the mafioso, mafiosi leaders who were uh, arrested and incarcerated and punished by the fascist regime were not put to death. They were given, some of them, life sentences, others long prison terms. But the result was a great decrease, a great fall in the crime rate in Italy and in Sicily. Already this was being reported even by the American papers by the late 1920s. And it continued as the offensive against the uh, mafia continued in that country. A prominent American publisher, S.S. McClure, was uh, present at the uh, trial in Palermo of dozens of mafioso, mafia, mafia leaders, and uh, he wrote very favorably for the American press about the fascist crackdown on organized crime. The campaign by uh, the fascist government had already re resulted roughly in 2,000 arrests and about 1,000 convictions. With the result, McClure told American readers, quote, today in Sicily and Naples and in all the regions heretofore plagued by the racketeer, there is absolute freedom from any form of extortion. In 1932, the New York Times told uh, American readers in an article on the situation in Italy that fascist Italy was among the world's leaders in instituting penal reforms. Again, this reflected the generally favorable view of Mussolini and fascist Italy, not only um, in the United States, but in many other countries. One of the great ironies is that when the fascist regime was overthrown and when American troops landed in Sicily in 1943 and then in 1943 and 44 in the rest of Italy, culminating in reaching, the, for example, the uh, taking of Rome in June 1944, one of the results of the American you might say, occupation of Italy during those years, was the return of the Mafia. Organized crime returned uh, to Italy along with the American occupation troops because the uh, Mafia uh, did and could, with truth, say that they were, quote, victims of fascism. Well, that was certainly true. And in town after town, people who had been removed from office by... Uh, the Mussolini government were put back into power or their associates were put back into power in many towns in Sicily and southern Italy uh, who were beholden to and puppets of uh, the Mafia, part of organized crime. As I already mentioned, uh, Mussolini was admired in much of the world uh, up until certainly the mid-1930s, not only by <coughs> Winston Churchill, but he was also admired by Sigmund Freud, by George Bernard Shaw, the famous uh, 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 Irish-British uh, playwright, and by Thomas Edison in the United States. And as already mentioned, in particular, the fascist government's uh, suppression of organized crime and the mafia won tremendous um, applause from people around the world. But the term fascism is used very loosely, it's not very well defined. Another example is, um, of that is the word totalitarian. Totalitarianism, a term that was uh, used by Mussolini to mean the unity in ideology and purpose of economic, social, political, and religious life in society, doesn't mean a repressive society. It means a society that is a totality, a harmonious society. But like the term fascism, the term totalitarian is very often misused, uh, misunderstood in modern-day America and in the West.